Where does your disease come from? Welcome. I'm Michelle with LaRouche Pack TV. I'm here with Sky Shields of Mr. LaRouche's basement team. And he's going to go through some of the work that he's been doing recently, looking at precisely that question. Sky? This is going to be something fun. This came up while we were looking at a lot of material on these major galactic cycles, the 62 and the 145 million year cycles, and really trying to get a sense of what's actually happening during these processes. We know that there's major upheavals that result in the, the disappearance of whole classes of animals, that result in the appearance of whole new classes that never existed before, and in general a set of transformations by which, which can occur by no known mechanism. There's no known mechanism that could be responsible for both the elimination of species their development. Um, in fact, it points you away from looking at any sort of mechanism here on the planet and towards looking, looking towards the idea that instead what you're getting is the development of a process, the development of, a, of really a whole where the singular changes that occur inside of it are occurring as a result of a, of a large-scale selectivity. Now this on one level is fascinating but on another level, as we've seen, it becomes a little terrifying because we realize that to the extent that we don't understand what that whole process is, we as a species risk becoming victims of it. Now we've seen that very closely, we've seen that very clearly in the case of these major earthquakes being correlated to phenomena on the sun, being correlated to phenomena on a much broader galactic scale. We're seeing this with the the likelihood, the clear evidence that volcanism is also on the same cycle. That in fact certain major disasters are in general uh, occur on the basis of processes that are much bigger than we're inclined to look at, especially over the last few decades with the collapse of NASA and the shutdown of the instruments that we would be using to look at this normally. Uh, what we'll talk about today is something that's a little, should be I think equally as shocking if not more so, especially considering the economic state of affairs that we found ourselves in over the last few decades, and increasingly so under uh, Bush, but then the real insanity of a President Obama. I'll point out some facts that, that uh, will I think, make the case, make the point. It was realized some time ago when looking back at the major flu pandemics of this last century, that is, we know there's a flu that we're all familiar with, the seasonal flu, that occurs largely as you're moving, the season changes moving through fall into winter. Uh, and that is something that tends to be local because seasons are a local phenomenon. You don't have the, when it's summer in the northern hemisphere, it's winter in the, the southern hemisphere. But then you also have flu pandemics, which are cases like the 1918 flu, where you see the entire planet gripped by a flu epidemic. But if you look back at the major dates of these, look at the second half of the 20th century. The major flu epidemics were in 1946, 1957, 1968, and 1977. Now, a number of people looking at that realized that there seemed to be a roughly 11-year gap between those, those flu pandemics, those global pandemics. Um, there was also one in 99. That immediately made people think, realize what we've been looking at as a movement and at various times on this website over the past, the past uh, few weeks or so, that, that that matches up with the 11-year cycle that we know governs solar activity. The 11-year cycle of, of from solar minimum to solar maximum. In fact, if you match, if you take those major flu pandemics and you line them up on a chart of solar minimum and solar maximum, the, the minimum maximum of solar radiation, you get a very nice correlation, as you can see right here. If you decide to look further back, 
and you look back, say, prior to 1940, prior to, prior to 1940, we had to use a different method of measuring solar activity. We didn't have an exact means of measuring solar radiation reaching the Earth, but we did have the ability to count sunspots. Now, sunspots work as a really good proxy for solar radiation, for solar activity. If you take the sunspot records going back to 1700 and now plot all of the major global pandemics against the sunspot record, this was done in 2000 in a, uh, uh, a paper by three Canadian researchers, Tapping, Matthias, and Sircon. If you map that against the flu pandemics, you don't see the same one-to-one -one correlation at first. You don't see an exact correlation necessarily between the peaks of the individual 11-year cycles and the pandemics themselves. But if you take a curve and connect the peaks of all of those cycles, you see that in the places where you've got the periods of the most intense 11-year cycles, you do in fact see a clustering of these global pandemic flus. Now, this is something that should be a little shocking. Again, at first interesting, but then a little disturbing when you start to think about what this really means and you start to try to figure out you know, what could be driving a process like this. It, it is very provoking because we typically think of, of disease epidemics as something that you can't, you can't know when it's going to happen. It strikes suddenly, it's a random event. Right. And it's, you know, it's a random natural event, so there's nothing that you can do about it. There's nothing you can do to prevent it. Right. And we've discussed before, this is, that is the, the conception that's meant to be, that's promoted in the population. This is the policy of the Olympian Zeus. You create a sense in the population that you can't really forecast disease outbreaks. You can't forecast earthquakes. You can't forecast volcanic eruptions. You can't forecast major crises. You can't forecast economic crises, even. Because if you get a population to believe all of that, you've got a population that's easy to control. But right now, we, with this, you do see that you've got a phenomenon that's much larger than we've thought heretofore, but is also potentially much more knowable, much more capable of being acted upon if we're willing to begin to act like human beings and take some control over it. Should we take a look at what in what an epidemic actually looks like? Yeah, right. In this case, the global right. pandemic. Well, you had looked at the case of the 1918 influenza, which is the, the Spanish flu. It's well known as one of the greatest pandemics in the history of the planet. Mm -hmm. And we have a short video presentation that can go through some of the facts, and then we'll get back to, to it in a minute. It was the fall of 1917 when the global pandemic known as the Spanish flu broke out in the United States, Europe, Africa, Asia, Brazil, and the South Pacific. In what is now known as one of the most devastating epidemics in world history, before the great influenza of 1918 had passed, it would take more lives than World War I, some 20 to 40 million people. The disease struck suddenly, killed quickly, and left the survivors unable to bury the quickly piling bodies of the dead, with great shortages of coffins, morticians, and grave diggers. It infected 28% of all Americans, and it killed an estimated 675,000 of them, with 10 times as many victims in the United States as the Great War. In one anecdote, four women were playing bridge together late into the night. But overnight, three of the women died from influenza, one by one. Other stories described people on their way to work, suddenly contracting the flu and dying within hours. A physician stationed at Fort Devens outside Boston described, These men start with what appears to be an ordinary attack of la grippe, or influenza. And when brought to the hospital, they very rapidly develop the most vicious type of pneumonia that has ever been seen. Two hours after admission, they have the mahogany spots over their cheekbones. And a few hours later, you can begin to see the cyanosis extending from their ears and spreading all over the face. It is only a matter of a few hours then until death comes. And it is simply a struggle for air until they suffocate. 
it is horrible. Another physician recalled that the patients died struggling to clear their airways of a blood-tinged froth that sometimes gushed from their nose and mouth. Due to the high rates of mortality, including among medical professionals, workers were recruited from local businesses to fill their flagging ranks. To try avoiding spreading the disease, the government implemented emergency measures, distributing gauze masks that had no hope of effectiveness, and limiting funerals to 15 minutes. In all, the Spanish flu was to rival the Black Death of the Middle Ages with its bubonic plague in its scope and effects. No one, neither the wealthy nor the poor, the young nor old, were exempt from its terrible wrath. Reflecting on this most horrible year, the Journal of the American Medical Association in 1918 reported, 1918 has gone. A year momentous as the termination of the most cruel war in the annals of the human race. A year which marked the end, at least for a time, of man's destruction of man. Unfortunately, a year in which developed a most fatal infectious disease, causing the death of hundreds of thousands of human beings. Medical science for four and one half years devoted itself to putting men on the firing line and keeping them there. Now it must turn with its whole might to combating the greatest enemy of all, infectious disease. So this, people should get the sense that this is something, this is not a simple question of a little bit of sneezing. When you're talking about a global pandemic disease, you're talking about something that's actually quite horrific. I mean, you get a sense that it was during this period of time, people were dying too quickly to even take clear records of it. You find maps of where the disease outbreak took place. Those are reconstructions long after the fact because cities were too decimated to send in any records to any central mm -hmm. authority. Uh, people have a real sense to what extent you had a real breakdown of government during this period. Uh, the extent to which you were able to have government managing to try and manage things, a lot of it was disastrous. The, the advice to wear masks to try to ward off the flu was absolutely useless. It had no effect at all on, on the, the rates of spread of disease. In fact, it probably just lulled people into a sense of comfort. Mm -hmm. But this is something that's hideous. So it really does make you start to realize, well, how criminal it is. You think of the, the, the st stupidity of the argument that's often used against NASA. Think of the stupidity of the argument that's used against um, manned spaceflight in general, that we shouldn't be solving problems out there because we've got so many problems down here. And you say, well, look, you idiot, you're not going to solve the problems you've got down here because they're being caused by phenomena that are out there. The source of what you're looking at here on the, on the Earth, the source of your problems here are much larger than, than, than you can, than, much larger than the field of view that you're giving yourself to, to operate within. And this is the same, it's, it's sort of a, a policy expression of the dependency of the human species on sense perception. That if you can't see it, it must not exist, but as a result, then you are buffeted and you are destroyed and often crushed, whole civilizations are crushed by forces which you can't see because they're not visible to sense perception. Sometimes that's what's called being practical. Yeah, I think so, exactly. Practical politics. Right. Oh, I'm being practical. I'm dealing with what's in my immediate environment. Mm -hmm. You know, it's an easy ticket to try to sell. Right. But that was, that was one of the lines that was used to take down our space program, was the argument that we're spending so much money out there, why don't we spend the money here to solve disease and poverty here on Earth? Mm -hmm. But as you're saying, that's exactly the opposite approach. Right. And we see what the result has been. The result has been a, a steady increase in disease, an increase in poverty, and a lot of the worst developments are happening underneath the surface. If you take a look at what's gone on over the last few decades, you start to realize that we're actually in a much worse position to be able to deal with a global pandemic now than we were even at the, the, the case of the 1918 flu. The 1918 flu, we found ourselves in a really bad situation because of this idiotic war that President Wilson had gotten us into at that time, World War I. You know, we, had, we didn't have the medical personnel that were required. A lot of our, uh, you know, these were sent overseas. Uh, a lot of our attention 
during the first outbreak was just not directed at the flu itself. It was directed at other at the 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 war and other concerns. We were caught kind of unawares, but look at where we stand right now. Right now, we're in the middle of the biggest economic collapse in human history. You take a look at what's gone on over the last the last couple of years or so. I mean, take a look at we've used California as the example. Look at what we've been steadily cutting emergency services as an expense. We've been cutting fire. We've been cutting police. We've been we've got had this insane butchering of our healthcare system just recently in the name of saving money. It was pushed through by Obama and the controllers of Obama. We're in a position right now where those are the sorts of cuts that people make because they look fine in the short term. It's sort of the equivalence of uh, the equivalent of trying to save money by if you if you stop if you say cut your insurance payments or something like that. In the short term it looks like you're making a profit. It looks like you're saving money. But then you set up a situation where you and your society become accident prone. We're now in a major crisis. Your losses are much bigger than you could ever could have imagined. You look at what happened with New Orleans and Katrina. You know, a lot of money seemed to have been saved over a period of time by not, by not making the repairs that were necessary to maintain the levee system there, by not, not taking the necessary measures to defend against a hurricane. Looks financially like you're doing pretty well for a period of time until a disaster hits. And that's when you accidentally lose a city. Yes, right, entire cities. And right now we're setting ourselves up to lose, again, to lose whole cities, to earthquake, to disease. Um, take a look underneath the surface. You've got, you know, there's a lot of discussion right now that a lot of the deaths with the 1918 flu pandemic were connected to secondary infections, which were common, secondary bacterial infections that were following up the, the, uh, the initial the initial flu. If that's the case, look at where we stand right now. Right now, you, you're seeing in the last decade or so, in the recent period, you've started, to, you've seen a rise in drug-resistant forms of bacteria, drug-resistant, antibiotic-resistant forms of disease. We've seen this with staph has developed the uh, MRSA, its drug-resistant form. Um, we've seen drug-resistant forms of uh, uh, tuberculosis. We've seen drug-resistant forms. Uh, a drug-resistant strain of gonorrhea is now spreading. Diseases that we once thought were easy to cure, that have now become so, that seemed so easy to cure that we just left out of the, the public consciousness entirely, are now making the resurgence, and they're potentially moving back to the position that they were in several decades ago, where these were questions, these were matters of life or death. We're moving back to the period where something like, back to the periods where something like strep throat was a death sentence. Under those conditions, if you have a major disease outbreak, you have a major pandemic connected to these larger cycles, we're in no position to defend ourselves. And this is as a result, we can be sort of chastised in the exact same way as Plato chastised the Delians when talking to them about the plague that had broken out on the island of Delos which is people, I think, recall the story of they called Plato in because when they prayed to Apollo to ask how to get rid of their plague, Apollo told them that he wanted an altar which was twice as big as his current altar. Now, the problem was that his altar was a cube, and nobody on the Isle of Delos had any idea how to build a cube that was twice as large as another cube. So they called Plato in to see could he solve the problem, and Plato laughed and said, well, look, the gods don't care how big their altars are. They're chastising you for neglecting the study of science. In our case, we're neglecting putting a real serious effort behind solving some of these problems, like you were saying, developing other ways to treat these illnesses besides antibiotics that are ceasing to work. Yes, right. And now we can see it means we're overdue for changing our concept of what disease is. We're overdue. Everything we've thought thus far about disease is being shown to be wrong by just this set of circumstances. The st common idea is to think of a disease as something like dirt. It's something that gets on you uh, that you have to try and avoid. Or, at best, it's the Darwinian view, that you have all of these organisms competing for their own survival, 
and just once in a while one of us gets asked out, either us or the virus is going to not make it. But in fact, you see a process that looks much more, much more complicated. We'll take, we looked at, the, we saw these solar correlations with the pandemic flu. Let's take a look at the seasonal flu. Now this is something that we, the seasonal flu and then seasonal colds are something we've taken for granted. The idea that as you move into winter, you're more likely to catch cold and that you're going to move into a flu season. This is something we sort of just assume happens every year. The state of sort of common knowledge about it is expressed in the case of the cold in the name of the cold. We call it a cold and many people believe that you catch cold by being in the cold. It's a name. Now this is something that was famously disproven by Benjamin Franklin who recognized that it's, it takes a character like Ben Franklin to be able to recognize this, who writes that he's been multiple times on ships at sea in the freezing cold and in the rain drenched where nobody got sick, nobody caught cold. He writes that he knows that he swam, again, this is only a Ben Franklin could write this, would swim back and forth through icy cold water, river waters. I forget if it was something like every morning he would swim through the icy cold river waters and never catch cold. But he had frequently seen somebody who had a cold come to proximity of somebody else who had a cold and then they themselves contracted it. So he concludes from this that colds are not caused by the cold, but they're in fact caused by the fact that this is something that is somehow contagious between people. That was a, a fight in early American history oh, okay. where I think it was the Mathers who, who were promoting vaccinations. And you had an operation to try to, to put political heat on the Mathers to say that they're, they're actually trying to infect people and thereby convince people to avoid these vaccinations mm -hmm. for smallpox in that case. That sounds familiar. Yeah. Right. No, so it's interesting. But then the question becomes, well, if it is something that's transmitted from person to person, why would that have anything to do with the, the seasons? And this is actually a big mystery. There's been a lot of effort put into trying to figure this out. Recently, there were a number of papers that came out trying to connect the spread of the flu to the humidity or other environmental factors that might change from season to season, trying to connect it to temperature. Uh, but then you get a number of problems. One is, even if that would tell you something about transmissibility, it doesn't tell you the other aspect. The more interesting part of the seasonality of the flu and the cold is its mutation rate. We call it the antigenic shifts of the, the virus. By the time the reason that you need a new flu shot every year is because by the time that flu returns, it's a different disease. So the question is, what causes that disease to transform on a seasonal scale? Uh, you would think that would mean that there would be a rapid rate of mutation of the virus during the infectious period. Because a virus, as we know, doesn't mutate except during replication. It doesn't behave as, as anything except during, during replication. Which would mean that while it was being passed from person to person, you would anticipate that it would be transforming, changing itself. But when they studied the rates of mutation of the virus during the infectious period, the infectious season, they didn't find anything that corresponded to a uh, rate of transformation that would, ex that would account for it being so distinct by the time it returned. I mean, for instance, the, the simple thing is that you don't find somebody, anybody within that same flu season who recontracts the same virus as a result of it having mutated so, so much. So the question is, and when is it mutating? You think that if it is mutating, it must be mutating during the so-called off-season. So uh, what this makes us think is that maybe we need to reconsider what we mean by a season. You know, typically people think of the seasons. They think of, you know, it's warmer in the summer, colder in the winter, maybe warmer and humid in the summer. Maybe the length of the days change. You've got shorter days in the winter, longer days in the summer. But what actually is a season? A season is, as the Earth orbits the sun, the Earth has a slight tilt uh, away from the, plane of the, from, the, from the plane of its orbit, 20 or so degrees. As a result, 
as it orbits the sun, we're at one extreme of the year, we're tilted away from it, uh, depending on which, which northern or southern hemisphere you want, you're on. On the other, at the other end of the year, you're tilted away from it. So when the, we're tilted towards, we refer to that as summer. So in the period that we, we're experiencing our summer in the northern hemisphere, the southern hemisphere is experiencing their winter, where they're tilted away, and then vice versa on the other side. But this is our sense perceptual picture of what a season looks like. What if we actually take a look at, use our extended sensorium, what if we use our extended sensorium to take a look at the to take a look at what's actually, what is the system that we're involved in in our interaction with the sun. And when you do that, you start to see that you've got a much larger process here called the Earth. What you're looking at here is the Earth's magneto sphere, with our magneto sheath, which is sort of the environment of plasma, which follows the field lines of the Earth's magnetic field. Now, this sheath here separates the Earth's field lines from those of the Sun. It has a very specific structure to it. On the, the side that points towards the Sun, which is called the day side, it extends about 10 Earth distances. On the other side, it extends all the way out into the orbits of other distant planets. Now, this is the idea we should get when we think about the difference between daytime and nighttime. This is something very different than just whether something is, whether it's darker or lighter out. If you zoom in more, you start to realize that that has an effect on an ionized layer of the Earth's atmosphere referred to as the ionosphere. The ionosphere changes in its thickness it's composed of several layers. The lower layers vanish from when you move from daytime to nighttime as the amount of incident solar radiation changes. The upper layers merge. The result is the whole layer shrinks. And all of the electromagnetic properties, in particular ones that fill the resonating cavity between the ionosphere and the Earth, change with the amount of incident solar radiation. So these change from daytime to nighttime. There's a similar change as you change seasons. Because as you change seasons, you're changing your tilt now inside of that same magneto sheath. You're changing the environment there, not in as simple a way as the daytime to nighttime change takes place, but you're looking at a transformation of the entire electromagnetic environment of the Earth in such a way that it depends on transformations in the rest of the solar system and in the rest of the galaxy. This is what a season actually is. Now, when you're viewing that, then you start to see why certain paradoxes would make sense in the case of the flu. Uh, for instance, in the case of studying of 25 successive flu epidemics in France and the United States, so you got things, you know, roughly similar latitude, but then with an ocean between them, you study the flu epidemics, not only is the onset roughly simultaneous in the two locations for 25, so 25 successive uh, seasonal flus, the onset is, is matched up, but the peaks of the epidemics always occurred within four days of each other. So the peak in infectivity and then its decline would always be within four days of each other between the United States and France. Uh, now, this implies that the entire life cycle of the flu, and not just its transmission, is governed by some kind of an outside cue. Uh, it's significant to point out that unlike what we see in some of these other cases of, of disease epidemics, the flu's disappearing isn't because you run out of victims. As we know from the flu passing through, it's not, you, it's not the case that everybody is sort of taken out as you would get with other diseases, which require, would have to sort of ravage the whole population before they're taken out by the, the population's built up immunities. The flu leaves when it's time for it to leave. It's very punctual 
punctual disease here. Uh, if you take a look at the places like a, a, another recent study that was done in Great Britain, you would think that if the main source of spreading the flu was because of vectors, because of people traveling, or because of, of even other vectors, if it was primarily bird or insect-borne vectors that were spreading the disease, you would expect that you would see an increase of at least a change in infective in in the uh, the patterns of its. You would see a change in the disease patterns as you had the introduction of human flight, as you're suddenly able to move from continent to continent quicker throughout the country. But in a study of great of the disease spread in Great Britain, the epidemic patterns of the flu have not changed for over four centuries. Mm. That's four centuries of transformation of, of motion, of the way of, of forms of travel. Nothing's changed about the way the flu, the flu spreads. Uh, and then sort of finally, the most interesting thing is laboratory experiments t attempting to test the transmissibility of the flu. And this is to give you an idea of what they are. This is, this is experiments in which you swab the, take mucus, from someone who's bedridden with the flu to someone who's so sick they can't leave their, their bed. Take mucus. You use their mucus to prepare a spray preparation. So you've bred the flu virus in, this, in a spray container. And they, for this experiment, took subjects and sprayed this mucus uh, uh, fluid into the mouth, nose, and eyes of healthy volunteers. And in the first run, nobody became sick from this spray. In the second run, I think they had some minor illness. Now, that's significant. That tells you something about the, even if the flu, even if some portion of the life cycle depends on person-to-person -person transmission, this is, an, a part, this is a part of its life cycle that's evidently not as important as whatever these larger scale seasonal solar and galactic phenomena are, play, are playing, their role is more significant in the spread of the flu. Um, so again, let's go back and take a look at what we've got with the, the Earth now oscillating in this very complex electromagnetic environment between it and the sun. And you start to realize that, okay, well, these are processes that have significant biological effects that we've discussed before. Uh, but they make us think now, back to what we've been discussing on this site with the 62 million year cycle and the 145 million year cycle. If you take a look at all these major extinction events, something that's often commented on is how peculiar the elimination of certain species is. That it's quite specific that all attempts to try and use major disasters such as asteroids or volcanoes to account for the elimination of species runs into problems because of anything that should anything that was powerful enough to eliminate the dinosaurs most certainly should have eliminated amphibians and this is not the case the dinosaurs are wiped out completely to a one but frogs and other amphibians make it through completely un, unscathed you also have plants living through all of these extinction cycles when you would think if there was a big cloud of smoke enveloping the planet, choking these dinosaurs, that the plants who require oxygen uh, and require the sun to exist, that they would have died out also. Right, exactly. And it becomes very conspicuous when you realize to what extent the extinction cycle of plant life is on a, is a completely different... Plants are on a completely different cycle than animals are. And you wonder what could be causing that, what could account for that? In general, plants are much less extremely hit than animals are during major, the major extinctions. Uh, and then there's lately been noticed the very conspicuous survival of photosynthesizing ocean creatures during these major events. Hmm. So the question is, in, in a number of the extinction events, it's also significant that the selectivity is down to, so specific that it will pick out only certain chemical compositions of skeletons out of the entire population and eliminate certain key skeletal compositions.
it's a very precise phenomenon that's happening here. But then it's also connected with a very clear introduction of not just single new species, but whole new systems of interaction. So the question is, what could account for that? Uh, there's good reason to think that at least a partial role would be played by viral diseases. Uh, bacterial also, but between the two of them, the one thing we know on the planet that has a capability of both very selectively eliminating creatures and selectively engineering creatures to have new traits and maintaining certain very specific symbioses are viruses. In fact, a number of major symbioses, if not the majority of major symbioses between organisms, are maintained by, by viral infections. We'll have a discussion soon on the site discussing the uh, photosynthetic sea slug, the Elisa chlorotica, which is capable of entering into a symbiosis with, with uh, chloroplasts and algae on the basis of a viral infection. We'll be discussing a number of other very specific types of relations here that what we are witnessing from our standpoint over our short span of time is just simply deadly disease epidemics are likely the, we're looking at just the outer edge, the outer fringe of a major, bio, major biospheric transformations that we are capable of understanding and potentially controlling, but which if we do not understand, we do not control, and we insist upon treating these things in a, a much more primitive way. Our primitive concept of, a, of and simple concept of disease these are things which will wipe us out and potentially wipe out our entire species the way they'd wipe out any other animal species. Yeah, I think it's important to reiterate the point that not, not jumping into this, not jumping into these questions full-bodied with a full frontal effort is a kind of a littleness that's going to get us killed. Right. In this period, that we're, that we're in this period of increased solar activity for the next two years, we're in... Uh, arguably a period of increased cosmic reactivity for the planet as a whole. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of danger zone where if it's the case that viruses are triggered by cosmic reactivity, then that's the period where you're going to be more in danger of having an, a pandemic. Right. Having something, having a mutation that could wipe out the entire species. And our response so far, the response of our insane president so far, has been to cut back the, exactly the kind of instrumentation, exactly the kind of programs that would let us understand how these processes work. And instead, now we're not even paying any lip service to solving problems on the ground. There's no lip service even p paid to stopping foreclosures, to saving the, the, the common man in the US, the average American citizen. Right now, there's no balls being made. There's no, nobody's even hiding the fact that his entire agenda is making sure that a corrupt banking system is held together. That we're, he's creating the conditions where first the poor but the whole population will be wiped out in major disasters and major epidemics. And then with such an intensity that we risk losing the entire species. At the very least we risk losing civilization in any form that we would recognize it. And this should give us what we know now looking at some of these major correlations, getting a sense of the role of not just the sun, but these much larger galactic processes should give us the sense of what should our priorities actually be and how can we change gears to make sure that we survive this period ahead.